Hi everyone. Welcome to the second panel discussion on ISCRAM Information Systems for Crisis Response and Management, Asia Pacific Conference 2022. Today we are discussing data informed emerging technology governance for social inclusion and sustainability. The strategies and frameworks for responsible AI and sustainability. I'm Dr. Mahendra Samarvikrama, Director of the Center for Sustainable AI. First of all, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Center for Sustainable AI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Many industry experts will be presenting in this panel discussion, so please stay tuned. At the end of the session, we will share how you can reach us for further information. When we talk information systems and emerging technology, AI can be considered as cornerstone. AI can create values towards social justice, leveraging data and technologies. However, it has been identified that human ethics play a major role and underpins the quality, ethics, and sustainability of the AI initiatives. Therefore, we will discuss about AI ethics and governance and some of the useful frameworks for responsible AI in this panel discussion. When discussing sustainability, UN SDGs provide widely accepted and shared framework adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015, provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. This slide will discuss United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a framework for environmental, social and governance or ESG. This discussion address multiple sustainable goals which can underpin responsible AI initiatives. We will discuss the 13th Sustainable Development Goals of Climate Action, the 3rd Sustainable Development Goals of Good Health and Wellbeing, the 17th Sustainable Development Goals of Partnerships for the Goals, the 10th Sustainable Development Goals of Reduce Inequalities, the 9th Sustainable Development Goals for Industry, Innovations and Infrastructure, and the 11th Sustainable Development Goals of Sustainable Cities and Communities. We will show how UN SDGs can support responsible AI and technology governance, innovations, and establish a success story towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Every initiative to be sustainable requires a solid foundation. When understanding the importance of the good AI governance framework, the following four facts are important. They are, it is predicted that AI can contribute as much as 15.7 trillion to the world economy by 2030. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are also planned to achieve by 2030 in the areas critically important for humanity and the planet. AI could help achieve 79% of sustainable development goals. In general, 85% of AI projects will fail due to bias in data, algorithms, or the teams responsible for managing them. Therefore, AI should be identified as a key enabler for community resilience and other sustainable development goals. At the same time, risks of AI fail is high and need appropriate governance. For supporting responsible AI initiatives, we develop an AI governance toolkit for ESG to support sustainable AI and sustainable development goals. We developed our AI governance framework to reduce the complexity of AI applications such that the leaders can focus on why, how, and what aspects of Golden Circle progressively. It promotes collaborations and partnerships and create a framework to establish shared values, particularly around UN SDGs. Our AI governance toolkit mainly consists of two tools, which are Kite Abstraction Framework and Wind Turbine Conceptualized Model. This framework and the model are inspired by the Red Cross 7 fundamental principles, social diversity, equity, and inclusion in AI, UN Sustainable Development Goals, ESG strategies, and AI for Good and Humanity initiatives. Our innovative Kite Abstraction Framework helps to drive the purpose of AI on ESG initiatives, addressing the key success factors of sustainability. 
it helps to orchestrate people culture and mission towards esg let's listen to this whiteboard animation summarizing our kite abstraction framework of ai governance for esg everything invented since the industrial revolution will be incorporated with ai by the year 2030 AI has been identified as a key enabler, supporting 79% of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This means from simple data point management to smart city development, different stakeholders will look into different perspectives in AI such as governance, policies, social justice, culture, ethics, strategy, technology, compliance, and sustainability. These perspectives are addressed in a set of standards, frameworks, and metrics which is referred to as Environment, Social, and Governance, or ESG. It will be the new strategy for corporate social responsibility. The Red Cross is driving AI for sustainability by mobilizing the power of humanity. We are collaborating with industry, government, community, academics, and volunteers in AI for sustainability. Our AI strategy is to enhance social justice by mitigating AI risks and driving AI benefits for humanity. The Red Cross Innovative Kite Conceptualized Abstraction Framework helps reduce the complexities in AI when addressing ESG. It enables driving AI for sustainability in more structured, systematic, transparent, and collaborative ways. The leaders can adopt this framework to drive the purpose of AI initiatives addressing the key success factors. Irrespective of the complexity of the AI application, this framework analyzes the four key dimensions of 1. AI 2. Organization 3. Society and 4. Sustainability The interdependencies of these dimensions enable addressing of AI strategy, AI for good, and social diversity, equity, and inclusion in AI. It supports the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Further, it helps organizational governance and responsibilities by guiding the orchestration of people, culture, and AI mission towards sustainability. Ultimately, this abstraction framework can underpin sustainable AI for sustainability. The Kite Abstraction Framework is a high-level framework which describes the key success factors of AI for leaders. However, to apply that on a real-world application, we, know we need a model which derives from that framework. Our innovative wind turbine conceptualized AI model helps driving AI for sustainability and humanity. It supports partnerships, volunteering, and community engagement toward achieving sustainable development goals. Further, it supports the organization's missions and promotes social diversity, equity, and inclusion for social justice. Let's listen to this whiteboard animation summarizing our wind turbine conceptualized AI governance model for sustainability and humanity. Artificial intelligence is the new electricity. To make AI sustainable, the focus on people, processes, and outcomes are important. AI could help to achieve 79% of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. The Red Cross Seven Fundamental Principles can enhance social diversity, equity, and inclusion in AI development. They are humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, unity, universality, and voluntary service. These two foundations can be unified to strengthen the mission driving AI for sustainability. The Red Cross Innovative Wind Turbine Conceptualized Model illustrates a collaborative framework for the good governance of AI for sustainability. It drives the mission towards social justice. Its process is guided by Red Cross personnel. The front face multi-blade rotor represents the seven fundamental principles that address AI ethics. The wheels in the gearbox represent the diversified community, volunteers, and partners who are continually helping in this great course with skills and resources. The generator represents the data and AI capabilities that drive AI transformation. 
As illustrated in the model, the Red Cross IT and data governance capabilities ensure data privacy, security, and compliance. Data science and AI capabilities promote social diversity, equity, and inclusion. This includes citizen scientists, volunteer data scientists, and AI for good partnerships. The data science tools, platforms, and processes empower skilled human resources, including staff, citizen scientists, volunteers, and partners. The AI projects focus on sustainable development goals, such as climate change, First Nations peoples, vulnerable migrants, international humanitarian law, and AI for good. Ultimately, we all can drive sustainable AI for humanity and sustainability. Our AI Governance Toolkit for Responsible AI supports social justice programs to serve the purpose of humanity and sustainability. It is important to mitigate the human biases in AI initiatives. In order to minimize biases for enhancing social justice, it is required to bring social diversity, equity, and inclusion to the people, culture, and mission. From the ESG perspective, the leaders should orchestrate culture, people, and mission towards humanity and sustainability. Our framework facilitate bringing diversity, equity, inclusion, and leveraging the data and technologies towards sustainable development goals. We have shared our AI governance framework and toolkit at the United Nations World Data Forum. Further, we shared this as a submission in response to the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet issue paper, Positioning Australia, as a leader in digital economy regulation, automated decision making, and AI regulation. The framework was also published in the Company Directors magazine of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. You can download the articles from the QR codes. We discussed the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion related to ESG and mitigating AI bias. When discussing diversity, we cannot forget the disability population, which is over 15% in world population. Recently, I got an opportunity to talk to Ben Clare, the disability inclusion lead of Exemplar International, to discuss the role of disability in disaster resilience and sustainability. He spoke about quite important facts related to this subject. Let's listen to Ben. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Clare. And today I'm talking to you from the land of the Warramai people, located to the north of Newcastle in New South Wales. It is indeed an honour to join you today, albeit via video, and to be part of this presentation. So before we get started, just a little about me. As I said, my name is Ben Clare. I'm currently working for a new international development company, a startup which is called Exemplar International. We work in the areas of climate change, disability inclusion, health and education. I myself have been working in the international development sector now for approximately 20 years, primarily in the disability inclusion area. I've worked in several countries around the world over many years, and have also worked for organisations including Christian Blind Mission, the Australian Government and UNICEF. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about the issues of disaster risk reduction and disability inclusion, and how those two seemingly different issues intersect. While governments of the world have been dealing with disasters and their impact for millennia, it wasn't really until 2005 that there was a concerted effort to work together on reducing the impact of disaster risk reduction. This happened at the first UN Convention on Disaster Risk Reduction, and this happened in Hyogo, Japan in 2005, where the Hyogo framework was adopted. This framework sets out goals that countries must reach in order to reduce the impact of disaster disasters on the population. 
10 years later, in 2015, the Sendai framework was developed, which is essentially an update of the initial framework. But this time, it references the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, a list of goals that are set to make living conditions for the world's population better over the next 20 years. So how does disability inclusion link with disaster risk reduction? First of all, it is quite common that people with disability are left out of planning when it comes to disaster risk reduction. Having people with disability included in the consultation phase and implementation of plans related to disaster risk reduction benefits everyone. People with disabilities have great ideas and strategies just like the rest of the population. Another common sense fact is that according to a World Bank study, some 800 million people have disability around the world. And that's a large chunk of the population that's often left out of implementation and planning in disaster risk reduction. So how does it work? How do you include people with disability in disaster risk reduction planning? The first thing is to consult, 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 because it is so important. You start by consulting with what we call organisations of people with disabilities, OPDs. These exist in most countries around the world. Their aim is to campaign for the human rights of people with disabilities in their respective countries and are very active in the climate change and disaster disaster risk reduction space. While you could be forgiven for thinking that issues like this only exist in developing countries, recent reports say that during the Lismore floods earlier this year in Australia, people with disability were left behind when it came to evacuation. Not only were they left in their houses, but the evacuation centres that were set up were not accessible for people in wheelchairs, a lot of the messaging that went out was not accessible. So when a lot of information went out on radio and television, that excluded a lot of the hearing impaired population. So a simple answer to that is to make sure that text messages are out. And this is starting now to happen in Australia. Having accessible, easy to reach and enter centres, evacuation centres, is beneficial for everyone, not just for people with disability, but having people with disability in the consultation process often means that they're right at the outset, rather than having to do building modification. Like everyone, people with disabilities feel the full effects of disasters and climate change related disasters. A recent report that was commissioned by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia and the Pacific Disability Forum explains how people with disabilities are losing access to their crops, their livelihoods and their land as a result of climate change. And how disaster risk reduction techniques and strategies could assist in making these lands profitable again for people with disabilities. With people with disability being such a large amount of people in the world, it just makes sense to have people with disability included at all stages of disaster risk reduction planning. Implementation is also the key. So uh, I mentioned before about text messages for hearing impaired people. These are great when, when alerting people of disasters. Obviously radio is good for those with vision impairment. When news conferences are held, it's great to have sign language to make sure again that hearing impaired people are understanding the message. And again, consultation. People with disability are just as badly affected as everybody else, so they should not be forgotten. Thank you. That is about the significance of disabled people in disaster resilience. The other very important diverse group in Australian perspective is the First Nations peoples. The Australian Red Cross Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership team is quite proactive in Australian climate resilience initiatives and 
working alongside First Nations people's programs. While thanking to Jenny Brown, Linesha Johnson and Lee Prowse, their knowledge, skills, thoughts and feelings bring the importance of First Nations people's perspectives on disaster and climate resilience and sustainability. Here is their voice on climate change and their heritage. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first explorers, first navigators, first engineers, first farmers, first botanists, first scientists, first diplomats, first astronomers, and first artists. Walawani, Nijinjiwan, Nagatagaya, hello, and thank you. I am from the Wandi Wandiang clan, one of the many that make up the UN nation, and I'm guided by my spirit totem, the black cockatoo. I'm part of a strong kingship structure and bloodline. At Australian Red Cross, we recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the First Nations, the traditional custodians of the land where we live, work and travel. We pay respects to elders, past, present and those who come in future. We honour their strong cultural and spiritual connection to land, waters and sea. We acknowledge we live amongst the world's oldest living culture and carry their wisdom forward every day. The impact of climate change on First Nations people is very real and profound effect because of the deep engagement we have with animals, plants, land and waters. My ancestors have left many footprints over this country. While growing up, my family were seasonal workers living off the land. We camped on riverbanks and swam in the waters. We knew the signs of seasonal change. We knew that seeing the wattle bloom was the best time to fish for brim. When the moon was dark was the best time for prawns. When we collected shellfish, we would return the shells to the waters to regenerate. We made baskets from the reeds and tools for hunting and gathering from the surrounding timbers. My ancestors would follow the Illawarra flame tree to guide their safe travels. And the totems would warn when the big winds, the rains or the fires were encroaching. It is very different today with the pressure of climate change increasing. First Nations people have been marginalised in policy, negotiations, mitigation and adaptation strategies. And this needs to change. The research Red Cross engages with inclusion of First Nations people on emerging technology to mitigate risk is very important for the future state. Hello. My name's Lee Prowse. I'm here today to talk to you about the impact of climate change on our First Nations people. Climate change is bringing about heightened impact through disaster. This has a profound impact on our First Nations people, more than what we actually see in the news and in the papers and hear about. This goes beyond material things. It goes beyond mental health that's attributed to the impact of disaster. This goes to the core of our being. First Nations people on country, lots of them, or sorry, lots of us have more than four seasons. The unbalancing of seasonal change through climate change, uh, sorry, of seasons through climate change is affecting our spiritual law. It's affecting our hunting and gathering. It's affecting our dreams time story. And all this can be attributed to the impact of climate change. When we move off country, we leave that behind because we can't do that, even though we still can do it in a, in a I guess, a psychological sense, you, to have our feet on, on Mother Earth. 
makes it so much more grounding and powerful. We also have the opportunity to actually heal through being on country when we're there. Unfortunately, if we move off, that tends to heighten vulnerability for us as a people. Um, we actually tend to start to get those compounding factors such as mental health, physical health. We're moving from lots of cases from a regional remote area into an urban, regional, semi-regional environment that brings about change. It exposes us, it exposes our vulnerability as a people to being able, to being unable to practice our culture in the traditional way. I guess that's about all I can tell you, um, but just really want to emphasize the fact that disasters through climate change are really, really impactful on First Nations people and can be contributing factors or are contributing factors to health problems, physical problems, and unfortunately, it makes us really, really vulnerable as a people. Thank you. When talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, gender diversity and reducing inequalities are very important. I recently got the opportunity to be an advisor to the Women in AI Awards 2023, which supports reducing the gender gap in AI. Women continue to be underrepresented in many domains where gender equality become the fifth United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, which is a key success factor to realize diversity, equity, and inclusion. From emerging tech perspectives, it helps mitigate bias in data, teams, and leadership, which is required to establish responsible AI. If you are female, you can apply for this award. The QR code lead to the Women in AI Awards 2023 website, where you can get more information. Now let's turn to the environment factor related to the ESG and disaster resilience. Climate change is an important research focus to mitigate future risks and vulnerabilities to societies, as well as the environment. In particular, we are exploring acoustic measurements of the ecological soundscape in regions of Australia sensitive to climate change. The ecological soundscape can provide information related to the social, cultural, and ecological aspects of climate change. In this perspective, we are focusing on the fact that climate change poses a major threat to the health of indigenous communities and their ability to sustain their traditional life, language, and cultural heritage. Following is our discussion with Professor Craig Jin, the Director of the Computing and Audio Research Lab at the University of Sydney, about how climate change can impact natural soundscape and cause significant impact on First Nations people's psychology and well-being. Let's listen to Professor Craig Jin's hypothesis on this research, followed by his discussion. Yeah, well, so I'm an Associate Professor at the um... University of Sydney and I work in um, acoustics and audio, so I head the computing and audio research lab. So, and I'm also a volunteer for Red Cross now through Mahendra and we've been speaking about soundscape ecology and climate change. And so we've been having a look at that. And so I've just put together um, a little um, set of slides here. So basically, um, it's a relatively new field really it's been around since the 1960s, but really modernized in 2011, so it's called soundscape ecology. And it's just like landscape ecology where you're looking at, um, you know, animals and species and interaction with the landscape. And now we're, you know, we're including um, sound in, into that. And so it's just having um, a look at these things. So there's the landscape, there's climate that impacts onto this, and you have a number of things. There's natural um, events, natural um, populations, and natural um, geophysical things. You have soundscape patterns and you have human activities that, of course, impact in both ways going through those things. And so, if you record sounds, you can get what's called, I mean, they have these terms now, it's called biophony, geophony, or anthrophony. So, I mean, basically, you can have sounds related to animals, sounds related to um, the planet itself, and sounds related to 
to humans, and these are all interacting, and it's 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 an interesting uh, new field, and there's a lot of research areas in this field, so it's not it's not what I'd say you know fully developed or anything like that. So it's relatively new. Um, areas of research in there is like measurement and quantification. How do you do it well? Spatial temporal dynamics, environmental covariance, human impacts on soundscapes, impacts on human. So the soundscape impact on human and the impact on wildlife as well. So I, we've highlighted two areas here, environmental covariance and impact on humans is an area of focus with respect to the climate change that we're looking at. And so just to speak a little bit about that. So um, we are posing to do some recording. So, I mean, we, there's biophonic and geophonic sounds. So these will vary according to environmental factors. So it's weather, plant and animal phenology. This is a term which I've defined down here. So you can look at the periodic events and life cycles of animals and also of the, of the planet and, and species and so forth. And how these are influenced by seasonal and interannual, you know, variations in climate and habitat. And, you know, there's various other things, solar radiation, lunar radiation, humidity, heating, heating days, moisture budgets, and all of these things. So all, all of these things can be re recorded or have an impact on sound, and so that's the environmental covariance. And then, of course, there's the impact on humans. So, you know, sense of place, place of attachment, connection to nature. I mean, it, it goes both ways. There's demographic variables such as culture, place of re residence, age, human values, and all of these reflect natural sounds. And so this is within the soundscape ecology, but there's also, I mean, the bioacoustics and cultural landscapes and, and, and recordings, they all merge. I think we're focusing more on soundscape ecology, but there's also the cultural lands soundscape, which is quite important. Um, so the cultural soundscape um, is, is, is significant for any cultural identity, really. It's the sonic values of both traditions and contemporary daily cultures. So it's looking at sounds as oral symbols of daily intangible culture, what we eat, what we listen to, how we practice our religion, who we are, connects people to their land by the way of auditory experiences that invoke memories of past lives, families, and things like that. There is some work um, in measuring soundscapes. Um, people have done it more for the Aboriginal culture in Canada. I haven't seen actually that many. I know that there are people collecting sounds of here, but I, I was looking more for soundscapes and really recording. And, and it's not the music per se of Aboriginal culture. We're really just looking at everyday sounds of society, everyday sounds. It's, it's, it's part of the cultural heritage um, that, that exists and that's, that's not well recorded. So clearly climate change is something that's happening. I don't know if you've seen this new article in The Guardian by someone working with the UN really posting a bleak um, really, a, a really quite a bleak article today in, in, in The Guardian. But anyway, so th there's many locations that are going to be impacted, and this is a website that, you know, shows that Indigenous Australians do respond to climate change. They have quite a bit of knowledge as well, and there's many areas um, to have a look. And if you go to this site here, there's, there's many different examples. Um, Mahendra and I were sort of targeting tropical northern Australia um, it's going to be one of the locations that's going to get um, very very hot so it's probably going to get it's, it's one of the regions that are going to get the hottest um, there's also a very nice study so I've just posted a, a, a picture from, from from that study it's done by the government so it's, it's, it's there's clear risks there and, and, and a good study that supports what's happening there so it's you know it's home to 87,000 indigenous people. I say it's about a quarter of the total population. A lot of them live near the coast and offshore. Climate change is going to affect everything there, it looks like. Carbon dioxide levels can affect plants. It's going to affect the human and natural systems, low-lying settlements, estuarine ecosystems, coral reefs, machine, marine food chains, and so forth. And so in in that area, if you, if you look at what people are saying, there's particular areas that are going to be particular populations that are particularly vulnerable. Um, so there's something new here. What is that saying? Port Headland. I have to. I, I have never been to the Northern Territory myself, so 
Um, I, I, I don't know the areas, but so this study is indicating, for example, around area around Broom here, this is Halls Creek. So there, there are areas that are particularly, uh, that, that have people are particularly vulnerable to the change that's going to happen. And so we've been speaking about trying to do a soundscape um, recordings. And so, I mean, it, it's really, it's got to span a long period of time and it's got to have other data as well, but it's, it's a great time to do something like this. The technology is sort of there. And in addition, there's a lot of good reasons to do this. So we're looking to record ecological soundscapes for research purposes. As I already said, there's a lot of research areas in ecological soundscape or soundscape ecology, but we're targeting climate change in Aboriginal culture. And so we do want to have get access to accurate climate data. So that's going to associate with our soundscape recordings. We definitely want to record anthrophony. Um, so we, 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 want to, we want to get sounds related to Aboriginal culture. We'd have to identify what are the impacts and issues around that area. We know that they don't like photos taken, but sounds may be a bit different. But this is really um, to preserve their culture, the soundscape culture, and what it's like to live there. It's just normal daily people sounds in their gatherings, different, different things like that. And, and that sort of thing would be easy to analyze in a soundscape recording as well. And, and then what we can do is we can look, we would be looking to place recordings in culturally significant surroundings near where people would congregate and stuff like that. So we would have also sounds of from the landscapes so of the biophony and geophony, which we can then try and correlate with the measurements that we would get from the anthrophony that, that we would measure. So if there are changes, and again, we would have to be looking for long time scales here. So we're looking to do research. We're, we're talking on the order of decades um, here when we're trying to get this type of data. And we can correlate those and then obviously relate that to climate change as, as we have, as we can measure the impacts of climate change and we see changes. And this is going to give then provide society a way to hear. I, I do want to get some photos as well of the changes in the regions that we're recording, but it's, it's going to give society a way to hear the impacts of climate change, which, you know, it's, it's always good to make things closer so that people get more, um, you know, you know, closer to what the impacts, what's happening. And if you can hear something and see something, then obviously it's going to make more impact up, upon you. So this is what we've been talking about so far and so we are hoping to get this together I'm I'm currently looking to purchase several of these devices here so these were made at the University of Oxford they're easy to get they've got weather housing as well it can go to ultrasonic frequencies though I don't know if we require that or not we would require that if there are bats in the relevant area then we might want to go to the ultrasonic frequencies if not then we wouldn't need to do that um, Mahendra and I have been talking about, you know, setting some up in our backyard just to calibrate them and do various things. But our concern is we need to put these in in remote areas, and we need to we need to target the correct areas. And we would need people to help us with, you know, switching the audio card, switching the batteries, and stuff like that. So while the technology is there and it's easy, it it still requires some maintenance um, and so forth. Technology plays a key role in data monitoring and early warning in disaster resilience strategies. These disaster related technologies require to be reliable and follow international standards. The importance of development of such capabilities is quite important for sustainability and disaster resilience. Following is a presentation from Craig McVeigh, CEO and founder at Simili, about the development of such capability and areas to be aware of in such research and development. Hello, I'm Craig McVeigh, CEO and co-founder of Simile. Simile is a for-profit, for-impact tech company from Timor-Lesse. We specialize in the development of multi-hazard early warning systems and water monitoring technologies that help governments meet development goals and empower vulnerable communities and groups to adapt to climate risk and build resilience. Our tech and approach is different. We aim to disrupt conventional approaches to deploying innovative tech solutions, which tend to be expensive, highly technical, and the domain of large institutions. 
we have packaged our hardware and software into an off-the-shelf, cost-effective EWS that is designed specifically for nations throughout the Asia-Pacific and communities, farmer groups, local councils and catchment authorities of Australia. Our EWS is simple to deploy and provides local scale information and alerts. Simile's multi-hazard early warning system is based on our two core technologies. Parable is our configurable cloud platform that links data to powerful analytics and actions. Hyphen is our multi-purpose Internet of Things data logger that captures real-time data from remote locations and seamlessly connects it to Parable. With Parable, you can visualize the data through intuitive dashboards. You can also analyze live data feeds from data captured in the field and global data sets via APIs, such as global weather forecasts, tectonic activity, or daily satellite imagery. Within Parable, we can set and manage thresholds against any data feed to trigger alerts and disseminate alerts to your stakeholders. Parable has strong data sharing and access controls that allow you to be part of a community by making your data available for early warning purposes that benefit everyone, or manage your data entirely for your own ends. We use a range of high quality Internet of Things sensors that connects to Hyphen and sends real-time data to Parable. These sensors are comparatively cheaper to technologies of the past while maintaining high precision and compliance to international standards. Together, these technologies allow us to capture real-time environmental data in the field and then with Hyphen transmit it via cellular networks to Parable for analysis. If certain parameters exceed set thresholds, alerts are triggered and disseminated to stakeholders. We describe Simile's multi-hazard early warning system as an end-to-end -end technology. This is because it has been designed to fulfill the four components of what is recognized as an effective people-centered early warning system. These components include risk knowledge, monitoring and warning services, dissemination and communication, emergency management capability or response capability. Simile's multi-hazard early warning system is being used to deliver a flood EWS for the capital of Timor-Leste, Dili. This project provides a great case study to illustrate how Parable is delivering in these four components. Risk knowledge. Using OpenStreetMap, we have worked with communities, government, and INGOs to map hazards and vulnerabilities. Risk assessments on this data have produced risk maps that are then made available as map layers within Parable and can be viewed alongside monitoring locations and data, monitoring and warning services. While historical data sets are useful for setting thresholds to trigger early warnings, in many places this is not available. And with climate change, those thresholds are often not as accurate. Parable offers configurable thresholds, so government leaders can adjust thresholds as climate changes. In Dili, thresholds were developed through discussions with communities, uh, paired with local expert knowledge and historical data when available. With this approach, and after one month of piloting, we were then able to accurately identify high-risk scenarios for flash flooding in Dili. We do this by observing and setting thresholds based on global weather forecasts to trigger alerts of increased flood risk with up to three days lead time. We also monitor in real time catchment conditions and thresholds established against key hydrometeorological parameters. Alerts are then configured to the government alert schema of attention, attention special and alert. Through this approach, we have many examples of flash flood alerts being triggered in both wet and dry seasons. In February this year, Parable successfully identified all stages of increasing risk of flash flooding in an urban river in Dili. Later in September, Parable also successfully identified the increased risk of flash flooding with one day advance notice via forecast models, followed by alerts triggered based on catchment hydrometeorological data dissemination and communication. In each early warning example, key stakeholders received alerts triggered by the data. In this instance, the government prefers emails and SMS alerts. However, other dissemination formats are available, such as cell broadcasting, social media, or sirens. 
Messages are tailored to specific end user groups. For example, government technical staff receive detailed alerts containing data, while simplified messages are sent to community and people with disabilities. Emergency management capabilities. Within Parable, we deliver on several response capabilities that are also linked to our people-centered project delivery approach. We develop standard operating procedures to provide clear roles and responsibilities to act on alerts and include these in specific alert messages to individuals. The community can also report damage via our Facebook Messenger chatbot. And Parable is also a military grade logistics and asset management system. It can therefore manage warehouse distributions as part of a humanitarian response effort. Simile has a great impact and reach from its multi-hazard early warning system technology. We have successfully used Parable to identify high risk fire days prior to wildfires passing through the mountains of Timor-Leste. And we've successfully used AI to identify high risk conditions for flash flooding through innovation funding from Cisco and Mercy Corps International. I'm Craig Mathay, the CEO of Simile. Thank you for listening and please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Last but not least, data literacy is a vital to make information systems sustainable. It touches people, technology processes, and cultural dimensions. I got the opportunity to be a co-author of the IFRC data playbook, particularly related to the data science and emerging tech chapter. In there, I contributed to how diversity, equity, inclusion, and environmental social governance can be leveraged to drive the ethics and governance in emerging tech and responsible AI. Heather in IFRC led the project, and let's listen to her about the IFRC data playbook motivations. You can download the IFRC data playbook via this QR code. So, you both mentioned that you work on IFRC's data playbook. Will you tell us more about this project? For starters, why did you name it playbook? Who is it addressed to and who can benefit from it? Thanks for the question. And I, I think it's fortuitous that we're on this humanitarian AI podcast because of the following. When I got to the IFRC, people said, oh, well, focus on data science. And I'm like, wait a second, where are we at as an organization? What's people's journey? And what their journey was, we just want to get better at using data, frankly, Excel, right? And I said, okay, pause, fine. So tell me, where are your training materials? And they said, well, we don't really have any standard training materials. And I said, but you have thousands of people around the world doing COBOL and ODK training. Where's their training materials? And so what, what it incepted was, was a couple of things. One, I posited that there's super talented people across the world who might have materials to train for our audience, and let's just put that all together. And so the idea of a playbook is to be able to use your best skills and your best space between teams to be able to create and to be able to explore things. And so there's lots of data training courses out there. There's so many books, articles about what to do, what not to do. But what we really need to do is help teams on lower budgets get better at their data skills and kind of build that organizational mental muscle. And so the playbook actually was inspired by Atlassian's Team Handbook, which is a series of 30 minute to one hour exercises that you could do with low cost, just questions and scenarios and games and designs. And the same thing with um, Nesta has a playbook, a DIY toolkit that was the same kind of model something that you could write all over. And this is what our national societies wanted. So they answer it, the audience goes everything from the data curious all the way up to the people who are data ready and our data scientists, friends like Paula, right? So how do we help those teams get better at data? And so the first playbook we published in 2018, we made it Creative Commons. We did that with people around the world. There were a couple hundred people around the world, events. We did it with some partners like UNOCHA, the Center for Humanitarian Data. And then we put it on the shelf and we said, okay, let's just keep working on it. And so in the last year or so, we did an upgrade. So we're at version one, which we're going to launch in uh, the end of the quarter, I believe, uh, which is working on some design pieces and stuff. And so this was done with 270 people and was guided by editors such as Paula. And we did a new agenda for it, a new kind of plan for it of exercises, games, scenarios, and checklists to help people on the data journey to ask those hard questions in teams, but also to ask the questions that we hadn't done as a network before, which is why the emerging tech module number 10 with Paula and Mahindra did 
is so exciting because it asks those questions around data science and emerging tech, which is where, where your audience definitely would like to see. All humanitarian projects are involving data in some way, shape or form. Teams often have very concrete questions and it is not easy to find answers. With editors and contributors across the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Network and partners, we've piloted, tested and upgraded the content of the Data Playbook from the 2018 beta version to the V1. The Data Playbook contains 120 short exercises, slides, scenarios, checklists, handouts and datasets for teams, presented in an engaging way through 10 modules across the data life cycle. It has been specifically created for group learning environments. There are multi-pathways for the teams to go on their data exploration, tailored for their local needs. Data is a team sport, and the Data Playbook is made for sharing best practices, learning and collaboration. With the Data Playbook in your hands, you can improve your team's knowledge and skills with data, strengthening teams and collaboration on responsible data use throughout the data journey. Wishing you and your team an excellent time learning and sharing. We came to the end of the panel discussion. Please let us know if you have any questions. We invite all of you to the workshop at the conference. You can engage with me via the following channels. Thank you.